on this edition of Expose. 16 years after the Exxon Valdez spills millions of gallons of crude into Alaskan waters, a Seattle reporter gets a tip from a whistleblower. Was another major accident on the horizon? Follow an investigative voyage. Big oil, big tankers, big trouble. Funding for Expose has been provided by Bill Sibbett once ran a successful fishing operation in Alaska, but in 1989, the Exxon Valdez disaster took all that away. The tanker, whose captain had been drinking, spilled 11 million gallons of oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. Everybody's heard about the Exxon Valdez oil spill on our boat. Um, in the next three years, we lost $860,000. You know, we struggled and struggled for years uh, and you know my wife and I finally sadly agreed that it's time to do something else. Sibbett moved to Seattle and became a tugboat operator. The Exxon Valdez spill had been devastating. The prospects of a major spill hitting his new home were unnerving. If we had a oil spill in Puget Sound the magnitude of the Exxon Valdez it would pretty much shut down all life in Puget Sound for a really long time. The impacts would be just unbelievable. On the morning of October 14, 2004, Sibbett realized there was no escaping the threat of an oil spill. About 2, 2.30 in the morning, it was a flat, calm night. It was clear, uh, good visibility, and I s ran into uh, huge smell of petroleum products and uh, traveled for almost a mile with the smell getting heavier and heavier and I'm feeling like this is an ominous situation and then we ran into a giant oil slick. I was working the day that the spill happened and I ended up um, staying in the office and taking feeds from reporters who were out running around trying to figure out how big it was, whether um, marine life was being harmed. And the oil seems to be heaviest from the south tip of Vashon Island to Maury Island. It's a heavier uh, black oil and uh, that's a uh, you know serious threat to wildlife. These pictures from Air 4 show heavy goo goo that can oil beaches, shellfish, and birds. It's not light diesel that evaporates. It's several hundred gallons of a poison. I mean, it was the scene of devastation. People are like, they're like, I can't believe my beach. My beach is being ruined. And it was, you know, it was very, um, it was very emotional. By law, oil spills in American waters must be reported to the Coast Guard. But nobody took responsibility for this 1,500 gallon spill. To find the culprit, the Coast Guard took oil samples from several ships to see if any matched the crude from the mystery spill. One did. It was called the Polar Texas, owned and operated by Polar Tankers, a subsidiary of oil giant ConocoPhillips. The company denied responsibility and the story might have ended there, but for a call to Robert McClure of the Seattle Post Intelligencer. It was a whistleblower from inside the company. He's telling me all these amazing tales about what goes on behind the scenes of polar tankers and and when I start talking to him and saying well gee I'd like to you know I might like to do a story on this that's when he can hear him getting kind of wow I don't know I'm not really sure uh -huh. yeah right McClure was on deadline on a different story he passed the lead to a colleague Eric Nalder veteran investigative reporter winner of two Pulitzer Prizes one of which revealed serious safety problems on oil tankers following the Exxon Valdez disaster. Like all investigative reporters, Nalder has a way of uncovering information few others can. 
unlike his peers, he's published the tricks of his trade on the internet for all to see. Nalder calls his method loosening lips, and in it he explains exactly how he's going to get you to tell him absolutely everything you know, and likely do it on the record. You get inside my notebook when I'm talking to you. Once you're inside my notebook, there really isn't a way out uh, other than to tell the entire story. The tanker story gave Nalder a chance to put his technique to work. He began with the whistleblower, a polar tanker engine man named Jim Legg. Whenever I am going to talk with someone, I will thoroughly background them. And that backgrounding will begin with um, looking them up on, on like Google. Nowadays, I can even get an aerial view of where they live and get a sense of, of where they live at. The next thing I do is I run them through a system called Accurant. It's a system that just piles information about people from myriad sources, everything from driver's licensing to you know, credit stuff, to etc. It's all in there uh, providing for you where they've lived in the last 10 years, how old they are, what their date of birth is where they might have worked, who their neighbors are, who their relatives are. And then if I'm being very extensive about it, I may interview people that they knew. I, I may actually interview their neighbors before I ever get to them. I'm going to do all this before you answer the phone when I call you. Are you a tree climbing dog? Huh? Ultimately, I drive down to, to Jim Legg's home in Shelton, Washington. It's this big fenced yard with a lot of dogs which is good. Dogs are a way I relate to people. I like dogs. The first time that I met with Eric Nalder, I prepared. I looked up um, all the information that I could find on the, the Internet. And, uh, you know, so I, I knew the guy obviously uh, was very capable. Um, but I, I guess I had some intention that I would have some ability to steer the information that I gave him. We go into his house, and I sit him down. We sit down. There's a thing that occurs when I talk to people. I kind of take over. Um, if you're with me and I come to visit you, uh, you won't notice this, but I'll walk ahead of you into the room, into your own house, and I'll, I will suggest where you should sit and I will suggest when you should sit, and I will be taking certain amount of control. I am subtly creating a situation where I'm in charge in the sense of you are going to be more and more willing to open up and talk to me. I quickly realized that, you know, there was going to be no way I could control the information to him. I just realized I have to trust somebody, and I just, uh, I think I started going and actually just picking up boxes of binders and bringing them out and, you know, uh, I think we were making copies uh, and just uh, basically I turned everything over to him. And I learned from those things and I learned there were more things and I asked for more and Leg went to get more and as he told me that story which had led from the previous story that story led to something else and I needed more. So he went to get more records and he told more things. Leg was by then, of course, like everybody who I ever talked to, losing uh, the control that they thought they had, but fortunately getting to the point where they could now tell the story. The story Leg told was a troubling one about an oil spill cover-up. It began at sea, he alleged, aboard another of the polar tankers, the Polar Discovery. Like this one, it was a top-of-the-line, ultra-modern ship, double-hauled, outfitted with the sophisticated safety technology put in place to help prevent another Exxon Valdez. They were sailing out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean toward Hawaii, and there's this job where this crew member goes below to pump oil out of a tank. Lo and behold, nobody notices, but 
as the oil is pumped, it comes up onto the deck, right out this valve, and is spilling all over the deck. And not only that, the wind has caught it, and it's splashing up onto the house, which is this multi-story building where everybody lives and works, and it's above the engine room. So this oil flows out the, out the scuppers, onto the side of the ship, and presumably and probably out into the ocean. Legg told Nalder that four days after the incident, he and the rest of the crew were sent to work below deck away from the spill. During his lunch break, Leg noticed officers doing something strange by the side of the ship. Nobody was really paying attention, so I picked up my camera, I went out into the elevator, went um, four levels up, and through a port light, I was able to look down on the crew, and that's when I shot the video. There's the crane outboard. So we can get a picture of John. They were hanging somebody off of um, a stores crane and using pressure washers to clean the side of the ship. John's off the hook somewhere there. Some kind of a rig. There goes the hose. I can't imagine anything more dangerous than hanging somebody over the side of the ship uh, while the ship is underway. And, and that's, that's why they had to make special equipment to hang somebody over the side. We wouldn't even carry anything on board that would be uh, suited for that. Legg provided Nalder with more than just an eyewitness account and a videotape. He also had a copy of the ship's log. What they wrote in the logbook was this operation where they had lowered this guy over the side of the vessel was in fact a man overboard drill. Conspiracy theorists would say that they wrote this in the logbook to cover up this spraying the side of the vessel. It was a disturbing story, but was it true? Nalder could not simply take Legg's word for it. He would need to hear the other side of the story and check for himself. Here's this guy that makes me feel so good and, you know, I trust. And then he says, by the way, I'm not your advocate, you know. Don't think that I'm on your side. You know, I don't want to give you that impression. We always have competing versions of events. So when I investigate ConocoPhillips, I'm on ConocoPhillips' side, too. Um, I'm not on Jim Legg's side. I told him that. I'm not on your side, you know. I'm, and, and I'm on everybody's side. I'm going to find out the truth. Nalder tracked down Jack Carroll, the captain of the Polar Discovery. Captain Carroll disputed Legg's account. As Jack Carroll tells the story, he came down and there was this huge mess on the deck and, and he's ordering people to do the right thing. Um, he then says that they got the oil contained fast enough that it didn't go overboard. Whom to believe, the captain or the whistleblower? Nalder had to find more evidence. He needed witnesses and documents. Whenever I'm doing a story, I want to get paper. I want to go down the paper trail. In this case, I let it be known out in the fleet that I was looking for documents. I asked people for them and suggested it would be very helpful, and bingo, they arrived in my mailbox one day. I got um, a roster of everybody who worked then in the ConocoPhillips fleet. There are crew members whose names don't show up in the story, but who talk to me in bits and pieces, each person reluctant to talk, each person telling me things nevertheless that point to what actually happened. Alex Dalsgaard, who was uh, a witness to uh, a lot of what happened that day, confirmed uh, spontaneously in a lengthy interview confirmed what Jim Legg had told us about how the where the oil spilled and how much it sprayed up on the house and who also said uh, that when they uh, lowered uh, John Morgan the crew member over the side of the vessel with a sprayer they did he said quote they did a camouflage job end of quote and it's a very important thing with their oil and wind because even if a small amount went in the ocean, the captain and then ConocoPhillips were required to report this to the federal government. They did not report the, the, uh, the polar discovery um, spill to the Coast Guard. The person who reported it was Legg. Legg, after he got back to shore and was concerned about a lot of things. I mean, 
A whistleblower is somebody who has seen a lot of things happen. Not just one thing, but a lot of things. And Leg was in that category. He had seen an explosion aboard another ConocoPhillips tanker, which was also not reported to the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard looked and confirmed that for me. He had seen drunkenness and heard about drunkenness on board these tankers. And he had seen other careless practices. And now he had seen a spill that was covered up in his view and not reported to the Coast Guard. These many warning signs are what cause any whistleblower to come to me. The whistleblower's story led Nalder to look deeper into how safety might be compromised in the tanker industry. The further he looked, the more problems he found. Stiff protections against alcohol use by tanker crews were put in place after the Exxon Valdez disaster. But Jim Legg told Nalder about a lapse in those defenses in the nearby town of Port Angeles. We asked Nalder to retrace his investigation for us. So I go to Port Angeles to find out. I'm simply going to go up there and be a detective on foot. I'm going to go to the tanker, and I'm, I'm going to go to the port, I might say, and stand at the place where the, the crews get on and off the vessels and see what they do. And I'm going to go to the bars and ask if anybody's seen them drink. Now, do you have you ever sat and drank with a crew member here at Delaney's from one of the tankers you mentioned, the Swedish guy? Or... Uh, no, I didn't, but I drank some at... Uh... The Gateway. The Gateway? Yeah. With, with crew members? Yeah. We happened to go into Delaney's and talk to the bartender and the barmaid. Uh, most crew members, they said, act perfectly well, but they said there are people who have gotten quite hammered. <laughs> do you see them do it then? <gasps> do you ever see them do that, though? No. <laughs> Nalder had more evidence than the comments of bar patrons in Port Angeles. He had a paper trail. We've seen union memos inside ConocoPhillips that speak of uh, crew members using alcohol or getting in trouble for alcohol use in the fleet. We asked the Coast Guard through a Freedom of Information Act request to give us records of any cases that they've investigated where people are reported to have been drinking aboard vessels serving the, the West Coast from the Alaskan oil fields. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So they work from back to forward here, okay, very good. Excellent. We only got four cases, and I was kind of surprised at that, uh, given what we were hearing is happening. So I asked the Coast Guard, well, you know, why would you only have four? And they said, well, there's no requirement for these companies to report alcohol use on board the vessels. Alcohol use, oil spills, Nalder's investigation confirmed much of what Jim Legg had told him. But Nalder was able to go far beyond what he had learned from a single whistleblower. Hey guys. Oh, Chris, Chris, I'm Eric Nalder. I'm a reporter from the Seattle PI. I decided in the series that I wanted to look at every one of the safety, um, the safety nets that had been put in place after Exxon Valdez to see the condition of them. And tug escorts were a very, very important part of that. One person who, t who explained to me the importance of tug escorts uh, was Joe Hazelwood, of all people, who was the former uh, captain of the Exxon Valdez, uh, who was very much in favor of tug escorts. He didn't have one the night of the Exxon Valdez spill, and it might have saved him from this terrible accident. Prop in fact, it certainly would have saved him from this. And here's what he said, Joe Hazelwood. The fastest thing in the world is a ship approaching a dock going full astern, and it is almost stopped. You are still gobbling up that distance. You are chewing on your tongue. The tugs are going full astern. The dock is getting closer and closer, and you are still not stopped. The power of these ships is in, its, in their weight and in the fact they're floating in the water, and a tug is needed to stop them if anything goes wrong. And you can be looking at a tanker, and it's barely moving. Uh, and you think nothing's happening, but it is moving, and it's moving toward the rocks, and you are in big trouble. Escort tugs are considered crucial to tanker safety, 
Yet the Washington State Department of Ecology was getting ready to take an unusual step. It was about to recommend reduction of their use for the most modern tankers in a northern part of Puget Sound. Curiously, it was a reversal of an earlier position. The tugs were indispensable there. Nalder asked the officials involved, why the change of heart? Who came up with the idea? And ultimately, they tell me that this guy from ConocoPhillips is the one who suggested it. It turned out that if the number of tug escorts were reduced, it could save ConocoPhillips millions of dollars a year. We've already been aware of the fact that our tug escort system is the most significant spill prevention mechanism we have. Why are we all of a sudden revisiting that question? And obviously, it was the oil industry breathing down the legislature and Department of Ecology's back that forced them to do this. Fred Fellerman, a marine safety activist, has been fighting to protect Seattle's waterways for over 20 years. Environmentalists wanted him on the tug study panel, but Nolder reported he was kept off. And we're dead center in it. Well, Fred Fellerman is an environmentalist. He's studied tugs, he's been on them, he knows people that run them. And, and so here they're talking about reducing tug escorts, and they don't want Fred at the table. That's significant. Most fortunately, the the attention that he brought to it made it such that there was no momentum behind the study. I, I think it was very good that the oil industry basically wanted to see that they can get away with something, and Eric, I think, helped put a kibosh to that. His methodical research uh, is sometimes frustrating for, for me that wants to see something that day, but, you know, to have somebody that cares enough about the subject matter to dig into it, ultimately it's a better product by the time it comes out. Eric Nalder began his investigation with a mystery spill. Two months later, he had a four-part series detailing a sea of trouble, from oil spill cover-ups to alcohol use by sailors to accidents at sea. Nalder never could have done this series without a reluctant whistleblower who not only told his story, but finally agreed to tell it on the record. Jim Legg was afraid when he talked to me. And he was afraid legitimately of a lot of things. He didn't want to lose a high paying job. He didn't want to lose his life. He had fears of going back on the ships where things can happen to you. He'd had some accidents and he knew how quickly with this very, uh, very powerful and complex machinery you can be injured. I talk to people who fear retaliation all the time. I listen closely to those fears. I listen and I gauge myself how serious those fears are. I allow them to work their way through those fears and very often they decide that things aren't as scary as it is important for them to speak on the record. Eric was able to take uh, the little bits that I gave him and really ex expand on that and you know, I think it kind of validated my concerns. I think, uh, you know, if you read the story, uh, you definitely see that there's a problem. And I think the bigger picture is, um, you know, could another Exxon Valdez spill happen? Nalder's method had worked. Lips were loosened. The public was informed. Jack Carroll, the captain of the Polar Discovery would have rather I did not tell the story. Uh, Jim Legg wasn't even all that anxious originally for me to tell this story. And certainly Conoco Phillips was not excited about that idea. But in terms of who do I listen to, the people who tell me whether a story should be told are those 50 cent a day stockholders who read our paper. I work for the readers. If, incidentally, we afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing for a newspaper to do. But, but that's not really what we're about. We're about telling the truth.
funding for expose has been provided by